Okay, guys, uh, this is Lee Summerhalder at TechStream Solutions. I have Troy Allen here with me. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, I want to thank everybody for taking some time out of your busy schedule to uh, join us as we dive into the art of content security with Web Center content. Um, we'll just go ahead and dive right in. Perfect. So there's a couple um, house cleaning issues. Let's uh, introduce Troy Allen. Troy Allen is um, our content management specialist. He's an Oracle Deputy CTO for TechStream. Um, he's worked in content management technology since 1998 and has worked with um, many what would become Oracle products such as Stellant. Um, and he will be walking you through the enterprise content management suite, including all of its components. I myself am Lee Summerhalder, Inside Sales and Marketing here at TechStream. I have 12 years experience in the B2B space uh, generating content, valuable content that people like you need to consume so that it improves your lives and makes your job easier. So as um, this webinar was spawned from an, um, an article that Troy wrote for OTech Magazine. And OTech Magazine is a very unique publication um, out of Europe that is one, independent, so uh, it's not connected to an Oracle organization uh, with the intent to relieve the bias of Oracle and give you straightforward expert advice around content management, portal, social sites, and the Oracle suite in general. Um, it's a free publication, so I would suggest you guys going out there and downloading the first edition at otechmag.com. Um, lots of great articles in there, lots of good content, no sales. And uh, in addition, only authors that are specialists are um, published in the, um, in the publication, so you can be rest assured that the content that you are getting is specialist level. So a little background on TechStream. So TechStream is an Oracle Gold partner specializing in the sales, deployment, resourcing, and service of the Oracle Web Center suite. Uh, we encourage you all to check out more at techstream.com. That's T-E-K-S-T-R-E-A-M.com. Um, we are headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, but we have reach in North America, including Canada. Um, our executive team is comprised of veterans from VEA, Oracle, Plum Tree, Stellant, and have worked in the industry leading to Oracle and the Oracle set of products for many, many years. Our specializations, um, content management, SOA, and the entire Web Center suite is where we focus. And we find that focusing on that technology um, gives us a specialization that provides our customers with, with a much better solution um, than piecemealing whole list of solutions together. So as we discuss TechStream, uh, TechStream is comprised of four components, four pillars or lines of business. Software from license procurement, uh, support, pl platform support, on-site training or virtual training and hosting solutions. Sourcing is our Oracle staffing branch, vetting resources from a candidate and client side. And what we'll be discussing today is the services component of TechStream and more specifically, the content management perspective underneath that services. So as you get into what TechStream does and why we differentiate ourselves in the industry, um, our mission is to use our extensive IT experience to deliver tangible business results, basically enabling our clients to profit from the advanced use of technology. It's, it's simple. We strive to build long-term relationships based on shared visions for success. And with a relentless focus on quality, um, to exceed our clients' expectations. And we, we deliver this consistently, and um, that's why biz, enterprise businesses in North America choose us. Um, TechStream is an Atlanta-based company uh, that specializes in addressing the company-wide IT problems faced by enterprise businesses, such things like consolidating, streamlining disparate content and application delivery systems, and the, the market challenges to create anytime, anywhere access to data for employees, partners, and customers. TechStream's IT consultant solutions, combined with its specialized IT recruiting expertise, helps businesses increase efficiencies, streamline costs, and remain competitive in an extremely fast-changing market. And as you can see, our, our Subject matter experts have well over 15 years of experience, and 100% of them are specialized through Oracle. Um, if you guys uh, have questions, uh, we will be distributing the recorded 
webinar to registrants of this uh, within a week or so after we can edit. But we encourage you to follow us and join the conversation. You can read blogs on our website in the newsroom. This is where we contain a lot of this content. And there's much more content out there for you guys to, to read and share and improve your businesses. And then we'd also love to have you part of the conversation on our social networks. Uh, LinkedIn is the most professional with a lot of value-added content, but then you can see how we work internally in our culture on Facebook. We encourage you guys all to participate, and we'd love to see you there. So at this point, I'd like to pass it over to Troy and get into the nuts and bolts of the webinar. Okay, thank you, Lee. <clears throat> and again, thank you to everybody who joined in. Um, as the invites indicated, we're really going to be taking a look at the art of content security. And as Lee mentioned, this is based off of an article that we put together for OTEC magazine. And it's really driven <clears throat> by a number of years of working with different types of customers that are trying to put together their security model, uh, whether it be at a departmental level, at a small organization or a company level, or at a very large enterprise level. So we wanted to start this off really with what are the type of questions that we hear or that get asked within uh, your organization when it comes to how do we secure and distribute our content? The next thing we have is uh, learning to use the brushes. You know, anytime you're going to paint a picture or you're, you're going to uh, construct a model for your content security, you need to get, have a good understanding of the tools. Um, so we're going to take a very quick look. Uh, I know most of you probably have these details, but we're going to take a very quick look at security groups, roles, accounts, and access control list. And then we're going to paint a picture with these uh, tools or with these brushes. So how do we combine these in different ways to uh, support three uh, typical models that we're going to talk about? There are many different ways of doing security, but those, uh, we're going to highlight three different ways that we've used reported uh, repeatedly. And then finally, we're going to uh, you know, boil this down and look at what are the, the pros and cons of the different approaches. So with that, a lot of times when, when we're talking with our customers, people ask us, you know, we need to protect our intellectual property. We've got tons of information, and we're fearful that it's going to get out of house, it's going to get to our competitors, or it may have an impact if it gets to uh, investors before it's ready for sharing. Um, we even have people ask us, how do we keep information away, you know, uh, and departmentalized? I may have uh, our security department or HR department that needs to have information centric to them not shared across the board, or uh, maybe I've got a lot of general content that it's okay for all of my employees, but I need to control who can edit it, or maybe I've got exceptions to that where all employees can see this content except for the small subset. One of the biggest things that we typically see, especially with existing customers, <clears throat> um, is when you implement a uh, content security, a lot of times you want to utilize your in-house security applications, whether it be LDAP or Active uh, Directory or some of the Oracle security tools. And what happens is you end up with an enormous amount of groups to facilitate the sharing and the protection of your content. What are ways that you can cut those back? So these are some of the types of questions that you know we get faced with and try to address whenever we go through a security model. But in order to address those, we really have to understand the foundation. And today we're going to be speaking very specific to the Web Center content and how it manages security internally and then how does that relate a little bit later on to external security applications. So at the foundation of the security is what we call security groups. It's a little misleading. Security groups really are a place that you store content and it's labeled. And this is where you start to get, grant users appropriate permissions to the content in these filing cabinets or buckets or you know, uh, placeholders, if you will. A couple of things to keep in mind is that a piece of content can only belong to one security group at one time. And uh, this really can become a hurdle in, in an environment where, hey, I, I really need to have a piece of content shared a couple of different ways or have different types of security applied to it. 
So we'll talk about how you can extend that through some of these models. But um, public and secure are two groups that come out of the box. And from a management perspective, we typically like to keep these initial groupings of content at and, and a fairly small number. And that's for management and performance. But we extend those um, through accounts. And we'll discuss those in a few minutes. Now, once we have the content in these groups, then we need to assign roles to our users. And roles give you the ability to determine what can users do to the content inside these groups. So as an example, I may have a role called public consumer, which means that anything that's stored in that public group and any user that has that role public consumer, all they get is read access to it. So roles can be assigned um, not only to provide content access, but roles can also determine what application rights users might have within the system. So for example, um, you might want to grant particular users, workflow administration, user administration, repository, or archive, or replicator, the ability to go into those apps in order to perform certain tasks. Users can have more than one role, and a role can provide rights and permissions to more than one security group. Now, oftentimes, um, we want to break down those security groups so that we can get more granular with it. And that's really where accounts come into play. And I think the best way to think about accounts is to consider a stair step. Um, accounts are hierarchical in nature. So what happens is when you create an account such as employee, the next tier down could be like employee marketing and then marketing creative and the marketing creative art department. And based upon where you get inserted within that account structure will determine um, what you can do for everything that is at your level and below you. So if I grant a user permissions at the employee level, the root level, and give them read access, they have read all the way down to the bottom end of that step. So users can be assigned, just like roles, to more than one uh, account. So I might belong to employee. I might also belong to employee um, marketing creative art department. Now, over on the right hand side, you'll notice I've got public and secure, and I've got this dividing line. It looks like the, the account structure split between the two. The reality is accounts are identical no matter what security group. So it's a subset of all security groups. And this really does provide you with capabilities for a lot of power as we get in some of these models. Now, something that's been around for a while that Oracle has really been promoting it uh, very heavily with the dot eight is the access control list or ACLs. And this allows you to uh, place user level or group level or role level specific access to content. Now, ACLs are a little funny in that they are restrictive by nature. A lot of times you think if I grant an ACL, it's going to override everything else. ACLs are really used to, to take a greater set of permissions and lock it down for a particular user or for a particular uh, group or role. And we'll see examples of that as well. So when users are assigned multiple roles that may grant the same permission to a content group, they get the greatest permission between them. So for example, I might have been assigned uh, public consumer, which gives me read access, and then public contributor, which gives me read write. Any content in that public security group, I'm actually going to get read write. So I take the greatest permission between them. Accounts work the same way. If I'm assigned an account to read, and then again another assignment to it for read write, my actual permission set becomes read write. Where accounts and roles come into play is when you have a role <clears throat> that gives you, say, read write access to the public security group, and then you have employee account, and a piece of content gets put in a public security group and an employee, and your right to employee is read, the only thing you can do with that content is read. And that's because when the, the repository looks at the, the permissions between roles and accounts, it looks for that intersection of permissions. And then when you have multiple roles and multiple accounts, so I realize this is kind of a busy, busy slide, you first do the comparison of your roles, you do the comparisons of your accounts, and then you compare the results of those 
to find out what your actual uh, write permission is going to be. Now, ACLs, as I mentioned before, are restrictive when evaluated and not a, a additive. And that's because it builds upon the permission that the user naturally has, and then when you get assigned a particular ACL, that goes into that configuration mix. So ACLs are usually deployed to users that, as I said, already have roles or accounts and are used to reduce the permission. So, for example, I may have a role that gets me read-write, an account that gets me read-write-delete. Between the role and the account, I would have read and write. But now I've got an ACL in the mix, and when I compare those, it drops me down to a read. So, the security model in 11G, um, as, as uh, Oracle moves forward for Web Center content, it's really driven out of the WebLogic server. And you can attach WebLogic Server to external directory uh, services, to single sign-on, to other security applications, whether they're uh, driven by Oracle or driven by um, Microsoft or other security uh, applications that are out there. So what happens is the Web Center content looks for a name pair match between the LDAP security groups that users belong to, the WebLogic Server's monitoring for, and a specific name or account within the repository. The role permissions are set within Web Center content. So you have a membership in your LDAP or your Active Directory, but then the actual permission is devised by the Web Center content as to do you get read or read write, read write delete, or read write delete and access. Account permissions are set at the AD or the LDAP group level by putting a, a, a permission parameter at the end of the group name. So if we think about how these typically integrate, we have the LDAP tree structure. For example, I've got the company, I've got a branch for roles, a branch for accounts, I've got my role of public admin, which maps to my Web Center content role, and then I have over here my accounts. And notice that the accounts have read or read, write, read, write, delete, administrate that are beside those. And the way this works is, if I look at Bob, Bob belongs to the public admin Active Directory group as well as the EMP Active Directory group. That means that any content that's checked into public and EMP, Bob can read it. Jim, because he has that same membership, can read it as well. Nancy, though, has public admin, which gives full access, plus employee account with full access, she gets the full uh, permissions of the system. And Sam, unfortunately, has no access because he doesn't belong to the public admin group, which is the first criteria to get in to see that content. Now if we put that content in public in the account employee department, we can see that Bob gets read and write permission because of the mixture between his roles or AD group here and the account or AD group here. Jim gets read write. Nancy continues to have read, write, delete, administrate. Sam gets no access. However, if we move this over, the same content and check it into secure and uh, provide the uh, account EMP, we can see Bob can read it because he's a secure consumer and he has the EMP account. Jim has no access. Nancy has no access because she's not a secure consumer at all. And Sam, um, even though he has the secure consumer, Sam does not have a membership at the EMP level. He does at a lower level, but not at the upper level. So again, just kind of walking through these, you can see how that mixture between our roles and accounts or uh, group tier and group tier within LDAP or Active Directory really have to formulate what our users are going to be able to do. So now that we've got kind of that base level concept, let's build on top of that and determine how are we going to establish an enterprise security. Now that we understand that how the roles, the groups, the ACLs, and accounts all interact with each other. So something to keep in mind, a lot of times people miss the step when they think about their enterprise content security, they think, oh, it's going to be quick, it's going to be easy. But there's a lot of things that you have to take into place, and usually it's uh, you have to get a lot of different departments or divisions involved 
to really determine how do they want to share their information. So you need to understand how are you organized? How often do your organizations change? And that would help you determine if you want to create a security structure based off of your organization, or if you want to build a security structure based off of some other metric within your uh, environment. So you can accomplish that by thinking of how are you trying to protect this information? Are you trying to protect information by client type if, if your business is working with external clients or customers? Um, do you want to protect it internally by a organizational structure or department or division? Do you want to protect it by functional role? And by functional role, it might be um, by departmental function. So I've got HR, I've got um, accounting, I've got finance, I've got IT, but those may go all the way across multiple areas. Um, you know, I may have an IT group that has a, an HR liaison. So within the IT group, I want that HR liaison to, to have a particular function. Or I could do it by rank within my organization. So we have some customers and, and clients that really want to do it. Everybody at, uh, at the CEO or C-level can gain access to information. And they want to break it down to an RVP. Um, or to uh, an executive vice president, then a director, and then a manager. So understanding how you share and communicate within your organization is really the starting point for focusing on the security model to support it. Other considerations is, are you going to share this content internally only? Is it going external? Is it a mixture of both? And then how are you sharing it? So some questions to ask is, what happens if somebody outside of my department searches for and finds a document and actually can read it? What is the impact? Do I care? Or should it have been secured so that only people within my department or my specific group can see that? Other questions would be, do I allow other areas within the enterprise to edit my content? So do I need to allow people to consume it or do I allow need to allow people to actually take control of that content and do things with it. The other item that we might want to consider is, are there any secret content areas within a particular group? So I may have a, a work group that I work with, and for the most part, I want everybody in this group to be able to see all the content that I'm managing for them, except for these two special people. They have their own content. Nobody else in the group can see it except for them. Or are there uh, protected users that span multiple groups. So a, a good example of that might be our audit department. Audit department might be uh, required to see into every group and all of that quote unquote secret content that goes across all those multiple groups. So those are considerations that we need to take a look at. As I mentioned before, we're gonna focus on three primary uh, models. There are many different ways that you can organize your security, and security really is unique to the organization. So these models are intended to be a uh, guideline, if you will, for users um, to, to access information for your administrators and your business leaders to start determining how you're going to share and grant content access and permissioning. The first one that we're going to look at is what, what I kind of term company public, uh, departmental restricted. And then a more of a collaborative centric security model and then a security model that is very similar in nature to the CPDR or the company public departmental restricted, but it is very controlled and has some limitations where ad hoc or collaborative security is not available that you want the same end result. So we call that exception modeling. So for the uh, company public departmental restrictive, what this really focuses on is where the majority of the content is considered public domain within the organization. It allows you to support the concept of having restricted departmental use information while minimizing the, the total number of security groups and roles that you have to set up in order to, to provide this level of security. As a starting point, it typically utilizes two account structures. 
uh, to control read and write access. And those account structures are, you know, for the employee or, or public, if you will, content so that I can grant everybody read access but control only those individuals that need to edit it. And then a second tier <clears throat> that I can very restrictively control my departmental-based information. Um, we also uh, want to set it up so that it provides that designation of enterprise or departmental content, and that's handled by those two groups. So what I'm looking at is a typical form that we use to kind of help map out what are our roles, what are our security groups or the buckets that we're storing information in, and then what are the accounts that kind of bridge across those security groups. So I can start getting an idea of, okay, a public admin should have read, write, delete, administrative permissions to public. A contributor would have read, write to public, but not to secure, not to restrict it and then so forth as we go through a secure or a restricted uh, admin, contributor, consumer. And then what are the accounts that I need in order to, to support the CPDR? So you'll notice I've got an example here where I've got employee, and then I've got employee department, and then employee sub-department. <clears throat> a good example of that would be I've got employee, and then I've got store operations, and then, and then under that I've got employee store operations, um, merchandise handling. So when I check in a piece of content and I belong to the merchandise handling department, I have write permission, read and write permission to the employee um, to merchandise handling, but everybody in the company would have employee read access, which means they could read that content I put out there, but myself and only those who have the read-write at that particular level can actually change that content. So if we take that and break it down, all employees will be granted the role of public consumers. That means they get all of that public information. It also means that they get all of that employee information from the, the root level. Accounts, imagine putting an asterisk or wild card at the end, at the end of the name. So if I had an, an account structure like EMP HR policies and I grant a user read at the EMP level, they actually get EMP plus everything that comes after it, and they get read access to that. Then I'll have certain public authors that would have that contribution role to public, and those authors would then have read and write to an account level underneath EMP for their particular area. So for example, Bob is the author of employee HR policies for that account structure. Then on the departmental restrictive side, I'm going to have this set up so that only department information stays within a department. And we're going to utilize the department account structure to break that down. And we can do this a couple of different ways. One is we might say it's by, you know, department and then the HR benefit, or maybe I do it's department HR and then I break it down by both a sub-department or a division level, but also by the um, organizational structure or uh, reporting structure. So in this case, I've got department HR VP, director, manager, employee or I may have department HR benefits and then director, manager, employee. So it gives me a couple of different ways that I can do that, but really what we're trying to do is focus down to a department and then maybe a level of user within that department. So if we go back and paint that picture with Bob, Bob has a role as public contributor. He has read access to all employee accounts. Uh, I'm sorry, as well as read and write to employee marketing creative. So Bob can check in any document into that employee marketing creative art department, but he can read anything that anybody else has put in into, say, the employee or employee marketing. He can read that. Then if we look at it from a depart, um, you know, digging into this from a departmental side, I've got Ann, who is an EVP of HR. And she has the role of public contributor, and she has read access to all of the HR depart, departmental information, 
And I've got Bob, who's a benefits manager. He has read and write through the public contributor, but he has read access only down at his level. So he can only read, you know, really the manager uh, documents that are within that benefit structure. So just to kind of throw these up as an example, if I check a document in based off of those screens that we just saw in the public and putting it into the employee market of creative, Bob, because of his mix of roles and accounts, can read and edit it or read and write, and can read it, Jim can read it. If I were to put it at the employee marketing level, all three of our users that we outlined can only read that. Then if I put it into that departmental specific area, um, both Ann and Jim can read and write it if it's put in at the manager level, and if it's at the benefits level, because Ann's higher in the food chain, she's the only one that can read and write it, and Bob has no access to it at all because he's just a, a uh, employee-based public user rather than a departmental-based user. And here we can see the same thing if we were to put it in a more restrictive uh, security group as well. So this type uh, of model works very well, but then we get in situations where I'm going to have certain exceptions. And that's where collaborative-based security comes into place. So we always recommend that for collaborative, you, you deploy that on top of a good, solid, standard enterprise security model. Um, and what it does is it allows you to support ad hoc assignments of permissions to users and groups and roles. It's designed to restrict already established access um, from roles and accounts. So you can, you can uh, determine, all right, normally a person would be able to read, write, delete this document, but for this one document, I only want them to read it. So that's really where an ACL can come into place, and you can do it down at the individual level if you need to. You can set these at folders and individual content items, and it could be deployed as a standalone model uh, for a small departmental solution or for small organizations. But if you're going to attempt to do it enterprise-wide, we really recommend that you put it on top of one of the other models. So with that, um, we can take a look that I've added a new security group called Collaboration, and I've granted public contributor read, write, delete, administrate. And the thought is, I want to potentially give everybody the ability to check content into this collaboration bucket with full permission, knowing that I'm going to use ACLs to strip away permissions for particular users based upon the use case of that content or that group of content. So all of our employees in this type of uh, situation would be uh, a public consumer or a public, uh, actually it should be public contributor, uh, all employees would get read access to the employee account. Uh, anybody that we want to be able to contribute in Either a, a very specific structured way would be granted a public contributor, but it also enables them to be able to contribute to that uh, collaboration folder that we talked about. So if I look at Bob, and we'll come back to him again, Bob checks in a document into that collaboration security group, and he's going to assign very specifically to Tom, read and write, to Mary, read, write, delete, and administrate, and Scott, read. So if we take a look at the other credentials that Tom has, Tom has uh, the ability to read the role, he has the ability to read the MP, and in that particular area, um, which if I don't assign an account to it, normally he would have read and write capability and if ACL maintains that, so he winds up with read-write. Same thing with Mary. Scott, however, um, has the, the public contributor, but Scott's ACL is highly restrictive, so it took away that write capability from him. 
And as we put it inside an account, you can see how that plays out slightly different. So we're, we're taking a look at the, the uh, combination of your role, your account, and then what the ACL applies to it in order to determine what the final outcome is going to be. The last piece that we'll talk about is exception security. And this is really intended to kind of provide that same functionality that you get out of collaboration security, but in a very controlled and restrictive manner. Some organizations do not like the use of ad hoc security. They want that to be controlled so that they can monitor it and they can put guidance and policies around it. One of the other issues that you may find with ACL is anybody who has at least write permission to a document, they could potentially change the ACL setting. So they might remove somebody or add somebody else onto it. And that's a, that can be a concern for some companies. So a slightly different approach to that would be to use this exception model. And a lot of times we see this where you're, you're really driving your contribution processes and access to content through a more folder-based approach. You know, where you're using the desktop integration suite or you're using, um, if you have upgraded so far to the dot eight, you're using that user, uh, the new UI, where we have drag and drop capabilities into the new UI. Through that foldering capability, you want to be able to display or hide folders based upon the user's rights and permissions. And a lot of times you may have a folder that's buried that you want to hide from some people, but not all people. And rather than doing that through an ACL, which is more of an ad hoc approach, you could do it through a predefined account structure to handle those exceptions specifically. So if we look at this, it really gives you the ability to hide that content. It's structured uh, and deployed for most security needs. So you have your, your primary account structure, and then you have exception accounts. And these could be flat or they could be nested, but it's a way to control the exceptions where I'm going to very specifically request an Active Directory and LDAP to have users apply to these exception accounts. And this is used when you really don't want to permit ad hoc controls. I told Megan, I was like... So you'll notice here that I added, uh, I've got the departmental or division level account structure. This is the one that we would use for the, the majority of all of our content going in the system. But you'll notice I've got an exception account. So maybe I need to just hide a folder uh, that visually people would navigate to go into a department and then a division and then go into some type of access level. But I'll have this one folder that I really want to hide from everybody else except for maybe three or four or five specific people. And so that's where that comes into play. So visually here, I've got this kind of broken down where I've got Division X, and then under that I've got their management, and you'll notice I've got these employee files. I want ma managers to see employee files, but I don't want the rest of the employees to see it. And then I've got best practices, which I do want everybody else to have. So my managers would belong to this account, eDivX Management eFiles. Everybody else may have complete access to DivX Management, or it's, this might be for EVPs or directors that may only have access to that employee file. That way when I visually go in and I navigate to it, based upon who I am, I'll either see that folder or not see it but I don't have to have different security at every single level, so I can really take advantage of my account inheritance. So with those three models, and we're, we're drawing close to the, the end of our time frame here, um, we want to look at really what's, what's best out of those and what do they bring to the table. So for that company public departmental restricted model that we talked about, it does help to limit the total number of LDAP groups that, that we need to apply to the system. And that's always a major concern. You know, am I going to need 50 or not? am I going to need 1,000 or am I going to need 10,000? Somebody's going to manage those at some point and add users to them and take users away. So anything we can do to limit the impact to our uh, security applications, the better off we're going to be. Um, Within collaboration, it also helps to minimize that LDAP because you can always use ACLs 
to, to perform exceptions, but I don't ask go create specific roles or specific accounts for them. Exceptions, if you have a lot of exceptions, if you're using that model, your LDAP account can grow. So you want to you want to be very smart in how you do exceptions and only use them when they're truly necessary. For applying permissions without LDAP changes, really the best one to use if that's what you want to do is the, the more collaborative approach. Because that's driven by the user. The user you establish everybody at a baseline, and then you allow the users to say, okay, for this content and this group of content, I want Bob, Jen, and Mary, and Sue to read it. Everybody else, I don't want them to see it, so I'm going to remove their capability from even seeing that content. When we're looking at support content sharing, and that's and when I look at that, I'm really thinking about more in the, the terms of, hey, I want to pass it around. I, I want to do that on a, a traditional ad hoc basis, and I don't want to have to call a IT to enable somebody to, to see a particular document, that really is through the, the collaboration. Um, and that model really supports that very nicely. When you need to get to the granular security control level where you have to get down to the individual, you have two choices. One is you can adopt to put collaboration on top of your standard security model. Again, the concerns with that is Anybody who has the appropriate permission that was provided from an ACO can remove people, add people, change permissions. But you have to be very careful and know what you're doing when you, have, when you set that up as a user. Not to scare you, it's a very effective tool, but there are some concerns that you, you should think about. The exception, on the other hand, can ultimately perform the same thing at the end of the day, but it's going to be very intensive with your uh, security team, so your LDAP team or your Active Directory or if you're using something else, every time you need to add somebody to an exception group, you're going to have to relate that request, you know, through whatever your internal process is to add them to that AD or that LDAP. When we're looking at being able to manage that change control for security, then the, the CPDR or the exception model are perfect for that. Collaboration you really don't have any change control for it because you, you're enabling your users to go in and do it at will. So if you need to lock that down and control it, look at the CPDR or the exception. Fortunately, all three of these models are fully extendable. As a matter of fact, you could layer all three of these concepts on top of each other so you may have some collaboration some exception that's set behind the scenes and it can't be adjusted by users, and you can uh, do something like a uh, primarily public with departmental restrictive information. That's the beauty about the system and with security. You can come up with your own model or your own flavors of the model and enable those and construct them in such a way that you can facilitate a wide variety of requirements. But you have to understand and know what people are trying to accomplish with that content to really get there first. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Lee uh, so that he can set us up for any questions and to, uh, to take us out through. Lee? Thank you, Troy. Uh, so what I'd like to do is unmute participants um, so that we get an opportunity to ask questions. I know uh, we ran through that pretty quickly, so uh, a lot of the value comes in me distributing this after we edit it. You guys can run through it, collaborate on it. Um, ultimately, what we'd like to do is engage in conversations with you around what challenges you have in the content security space, and then uh, explain if we're positioned or understand if we're positioned to help. So uh, let me go ahead and unmute the line. All participants are now unmuted. So I'd like to open it up to the group. Are there any questions that uh, you have on mind? Going once. Going twice. Well, there's one question. In, in some of the older Oracle documentation or, or those that wrote about it, they talked about ACLs could potentially give you a performance hit. That go away in the eleven, the latest eleven G versions of all this. 
Yes, it, it's definitely moved forward. Uh, my, my personal recommendation, if you are currently on 10G or older, the ACL does have a performance hit, um, and it does become heavy on the system. It's okay if you're doing it very small level, um, but if, you're, if you really want to deploy that enterprise-wide, my recommendation in 10G is not to. 11G, those performance issues have gone away, and it's really become a valid model in 11G, um, especially in the .8. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'll, you'll, if you've seen any of the new intros to the .8 release of Web Center content, ACL is very heavily used, and, and the performance on that is exceptional. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, any other questions? Yeah, is it possible to get the slides? Uh, the recording or the slides themselves? Uh, the slides. Um, that's a little harder for us to do. Uh, I can give you a PDF version of the slides if that helps. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I can do that. Who is who is that asking the question? Um, we're at Lawrence Livermore. I can uh, text my email up here. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I think I had you registered. You said Brent? Uh, uh, Wayne Cool, K O O L. I put the email in. Uh, cool, I got it. Excellent. So yeah, I will. Uh, I'll shoot that over to you. We can package that up uh, today and send that over. But we will have the edited version of this power uh, this presentation on YouTube, and then I'll send you a copy of the link to that so that you guys can digest that great. on your own time. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no problem. Let's um, <clears throat> open it up. Is there any more questions? By the way, a lot of this content also is a repeat of what's in the OTEC uh, magazine article. So I did add a few more. You know, obviously, there's not a lot you could do in, a, in the magazine to be able to reflect dynamically what happens when people move through an AV group or whatnot. So, uh, Lee, that's one thing that when we print it out, we will make sure that we get the layers okay. so that they can see the, the, the builds. You know, for when we have Bob and so forth, so they can see how that works out. So just the final frame of that. Yeah. Slide. That doesn't help. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd like to I'd like to ask you guys if uh, you had a second to provide us feedback, feedback of any sort, feedback on the content, feedback on the platform we use to present the content, feedback on um, invites, so forth. If you guys had a, a candid moment to send us an email, let me know what you thought that would really help us improve future webinars. Um, and with that, if we don't have any more questions, I'd like to thank you guys again from TechStream team to you guys. Uh, we'll be reaching out with you, to you shortly with the recording.